Okay, well, I'm John Dirks, and I'm a professor of higher adult and lifelong education at Michigan State University. Yes, hi, I'm Lyndon West. I'm professor of education at Canterbury Christchurch University in the United Kingdom. Well, I could probably start with that Please, con yeah. conversation. Um, for me, work is intrinsic to our sense of who we are as a self and our sense of self-identity. And so I've always thought that that process of our relationship of the self to work was um, a kind of contested one, but it's also volatile and um, emotional and engaging. And so for me to make work meaningful and to help prepare people for the world of work, I th I've thought that it was necessary to pay attention to the transformative dimensions that arise within the context of that. So work is very important in my thinking about transformative learning. Yeah, it's, it's the same, same for me. And I, I think I'd want to, to say part of the value base is to try to create spaces, good enough spaces, where you know, people can take risks, they can ask mm -hmm. questions, they can learn to listen, um, m maybe to see themselves in a slightly different way. I think culturally mo moving into, say, a university is a huge step for, for, for some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. and, and the big question for me, if we're thinking about transformation, how do we create good enough spaces where something interesting, dynamic, maybe almost democratic begins to happen? Mm -hmm. I also think it's a, it's a job we all have to engage in to think about the self we bring mm -hmm. into that space. And often I think it's... Uh, uh, a quality of uh, attentiveness, attentiveness to ourselves, as well as attentiveness to, to others. We, we've got to do a bit of performance, but in a way it's, it's attentiveness and it's an attunement to what mm -hmm. is going on mm -hmm. um, as people cross cultural boundaries or as they engage with the other and otherness, including otherness within, I think. Yeah, I think that's another area where you and I sort of have a similar interest. I started out my sort of academic career by the study of group dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, our approach in the laboratory to group dynamics was to look at it as a kind of holding environment. That mm -hmm. was, there was lots of things that went on, but mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the things that you talked about, sort of learning to uh, work across difference, uh, to hold and to contain sort of potentially volatile and destructive sorts of emotions and urges. and. So there was just a, you know, the, we found that the group dynamics environment sort of very rich environment, very rich context, I think, for touching on many of the things that you, that you mm. talked about. And um, it's kind of like a, well, I mean, it's like Philip Slater, right? It's, it, he viewed groups as a microcosm of society, and I think he was absolutely correct. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we've just been watching a session, haven't we, on social democracy mm -hmm. and the struggle for um, social democracy and how difficult it it, it, it can be. At one level, it's very easy to talk about, well, you know, we create a good enough groups, but the, the tensions within mm -hmm. that, and what, one of the things might be in group dynamics is the circulation of power. Yeah. And, and that's not just a conscious thing. Some people might re represent at, a, at an unconscious level authority figures, and that might um, evoke, you know, kind of hatred and attacks, or it can be silencing. So how we make sense of some of these things, I think, is actually the act of trying to make sense of them can itself as a process be transformative sure, <laughs> because it sure, asks yeah. so many questions of ourselves right. and what we're doing and our need really to, to be learners, to be lifelong learners mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. I mean, whenever you ask the question, don't we, how do I perceive, understand and make sense of this experience, it naturally leads into this sort of transformative mm -hmm. domain, I think, and you begin to sort of look at things the, the other thing I like about groups is that in, in every group there's always the individual and the collective. So mm. it's not an either or thing when you're talking about these kinds of learning environments. They're both and. So you can't bring about meaningful individual change without attention to the collective and vice versa. And so there's lots of things that, and these, these groups go on in the work environment. So that, you know, in the context of work groups, you see, we see these very similar kinds of things. So it's been a very rich context and tradition for me to think about these things from, uh, you know, what you would regard, and I think many of us would, as psychodynamic perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps it's worth saying that we both, I mean, you bring more of a Jungian dimension. Right. I, I think I bring a, a, a mix, a bit of Freudianism and a bit of uh, what, 
in the British context will be called object relations mm -hmm. theory. And mm -hmm. I, so so the, the sort of internalization of um, qualities in our um, intersubjective life, internally into right. our intrasubjective life. So if you've got somebody who bullies you or whatever an early experience, then the sense that object becomes part of your psychic life. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way you have to learn that that's happening and maybe your aggression to, to others is part, and, and your aggression to self is, is, is part of something that needs to be thought about. John, can I ask you about transformation and, and itself? I mean, I, I, I suppose I, uh, when I get off the aeroplane, I see in airports, you know, transform yourself, transform your lives, transform your, your company. And I, I it's this a kind of, of hits me, yeah. <laughs> hits me in the face uh, all the time. So it sets up a slight um, sceptical um, reaction. It's a word that can be easily overdone. And also, if I think more autobiographically, um, the struggle to transform has been lifelong. It's yeah. not something that's right. there in an instant. In a, in a society which is, in a sense, so demanding of instant instantaneity, <laughs> The immediate, the 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 solution now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, um, transformation is intimately bound up with the realization of who we are, ourselves as persons. And so, and again, from a Jungian point of view, I'm looking to the process of individuation, mm. of the ways in which our separate selves become distinct mini personalities mm -hmm. within, our, within our psyches and the ways in which they then realize themselves, express themselves, and come together in a more integrated way. That's, for me, the process of transformation. And that process is indeed a lifelong. It's yeah. not something that you do in a workshop or a two-day, you know, it's, it goes on forever. So if, when I think about transformative learning, Lyndon, I think about it in the context of the everydayness of our lives. For mm. me, it's a stance towards my being in the world. Yeah. It's really about I, I you know when I when I see those signs on the airports and the buses and yeah, stuff, yeah. it's like they're not they're more than just that. They tell me about you know what what seems to be resonating with the with society with individuals. Why are we using these kinds of terms? What's going on with all of that? So, and then there's there's you know there's like the airplane visit. The, I think I shared with you earlier the instance that we had on the airplane about this person worrying about his computer being smashed in the. Above. Mm -hmm. You know, little things like that, I, I, I notice and I take wonder and I wonder why I wonder. So it's not just sort of trying to understand what he or she is doing and what that means, but it's why is my attention drawn to that in the first place? What does that mean? Why, why does this, why are these feelings, these dispositions evoked within me? And I, and I just need to say that I think your work has helped me connect some other sort of theoretical frameworks to this, because Jung and post-Jungians aren't, they, they weren't terribly big on groups, on group work. No. I mean, they were, they were, in some, they had even sort of issues with it, but your work and the ways in which you used psychoanalysis in your work has helped me understand how we might begin to bridge some of these things to, to provide for more, th more powerful theoretical explanations for some of these things. Yes, and I, I think I want to celebrate something very much about you at the moment as well, but just to say the integration thing um, and, and it's you know, we, we can think of transformative learning or transformation as a linear process you right. know go from right. disintegration or disequilibrium into something which is more integrated but actually i think it's 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 messy and confused and new situations can evoke old reactions yeah. <laughs> that still need some uh, right. attention i mean in, in terms of in terms of uh, something that I think has been important in my own, um, what Jung would have called integration, um, is, is to do with um, a, a kind of, a, and I think this happens a lot in the academy, a need to shine, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a need to be um, a good performer, right. uh, a need always to do um, well. And the, the difficulty with that is, I mean, it, I, I think it can be formed in our very earliest experience. Um, you know, Winnicott, Donald Winnicott, who's mm -hmm. a very distinguished psychoanalyst, poetically talked about when we are seen, we can see. Yeah. And I love yeah. that statement, yeah. but sometimes we aren't seen, mm -hmm. so we have to start performing. <laughs> and and in, in a way to, 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 to get beyond that and to have a conversation, say even at a conference like this, you know, just, just 
calm down, just breathe more mm -hmm. diaphragmatically. Mm -hmm. Just also recognize your ordinariness, be kind to yeah. yourself. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say to you about, um, about your work, I, I, I do think, because we often interact with each other via you know, our writing, and, and I, I, I think there's something uh, transformational in, 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 for instance, the way you write. I mean, I, I've been completing a book, as you know, with mm. Laura Fomenti on transforming perspectives in lifelong learning and adult education. And I came across a piece that, 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 that you wrote which spoke very deeply to me. And it's, I think it's to do with being attentive. Mm. And it's to do with a, almost a poetic sense mm -hmm. uh, of, mm -hmm. of the moment. So I think the question you pose is something like how, how often do we talk about a beautiful idea in a lecture mm -hmm. or um, something poetic which touched our soul in s terms of something that's just been said yeah, yeah. or um, the, almost the transcendental quality of the good group where there's a kind of collective set yeah, of souls right. singing. And, and I think you, you have used the language that seems to me to be often annihilated in, in the academy because so much of the language is what I would call scientistic. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of objective and it's got out of kilter with the complexities, subtleties and messiness of human experience, but also the poetry of human experience. Right. This is another area, I think, where our work sort of intersects or overlaps, <coughs> because you've written, clearly written about sort of the, the notion of enchantment and re-enchantment. Yep. You've given that some thought. And that really speaks to the, what uh, James Hillman and Thomas Moore and others talked about is the mythopoetic nature of the yes. psyche. It's the, it's the storytelling aspect. It's the myth-generating potential, and that's that's what I pay attention to when I'm thinking about and studying and working with transformative learning. I'm not looking at sort of the, the logic and the reasoning mm. and, the, and that sort of thing. I'm looking at the words and phrases and behaviors uh, as images, mm. as expressions of the, as, as imaginative expressions. Because mm. you know, there's a whole, we can, we can choose to represent the way that we're feeling and the way that we're being in a hundred thousand different ways. Why do we choose the images that we choose? Where does that come from? In my sense, is it's 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 evoked uh, mm. these these objects that are out there. And you talked about object relations. They they evoke within us certain kinds of things, which then become the kind of grist for the mill, if you will, in terms of transformative learning. They provide us with the language to to do that kind of work. So I think that's another area where we sort of overlap or intersect. What I'm I'm troubled about very often is is the the way our perspective is framed not to see. Yeah. But we, we don't see certain things. So if you, if you have a kind of, let's call it a more scientific mindset, you might miss some of the poetry. So you end right. up locked into you know, thinking about cognition as yeah. at the core of transformation, where you may not be observing other things that, 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 that are going on. It's, it's that sensitivity towards the sheer complexity of being human, including what we don't know. <laughs> Right. Or right. the mystery of, of, of being human, and they're the great poets like Blake, etc., help right. us, right. I think. That's actually an aspect of what concerns me in my current work. As a classroom teacher, for example, I know that as I'm working in that role, I, sh I need to be paying attention to these dimensions of the learning experience, but it's incredibly difficult because of the things that you just said. Mm. There is this sort of overarching ethos within the academy and within even professional development circles, and even if you conclude them, there is this, this idea that there's a way in which this is defined. Learning is defined in a certain kind of way, and if you try to do, you know, pay attention to things outside of that very traditional way of thinking about learning, it becomes very st stressful for the students and, and awkward, and mm. you know, things get messy very, very mm. quickly. So that's another part that I, as I sort of deepen my understanding of, of transformative learning as I, under, as I see it and understand it, it's like, how in the world do we actually even work with this in a practice kind of context? You know, mm. how do we begin to sort of do this in a more fluid and natural sort of way rather than to have rituals and workshops and things like that, which I, I don't particularly, I don't particularly um, support, I think, in, te in regular teaching. I think those are sort of, you know, um, they, they, they're not natural to the setting, I think. And that, what I'm interested in is using that which is natural in the setting to sort of generate these kinds of 
languages that we're talking about? Well, I, I think <laughs> I th it's hugely problematic. I mean, I think a quality of stillness in mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. can be helpful sometimes in the chaos of a, a classroom. That's what I like about the mindfulness uh, yeah. movement. Even though it's not directly speaking to transformative learning per se, I think it has a lot to offer us in terms of understanding what, what this mm. might actually look like on the ground in the real world, kinds of things. I, I think, I mean, a lot of my work nowadays is with doctoral students and, you know, their research. And I, I, I like to tell a story, which I'd like to share with you, mm. that, about what we see and what we don't see. And it comes from a lovely book called What Mothers Do When They're Apparently Doing Nothing. Mm. And it's the nothing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think we, we should focus on. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a story of a, it is actually based on experience. A, research, a male researcher goes in to interview um, a young mum with a young baby about a parenting program. And uh, the door is open and there's a scream, come in. And the, the male researcher looks around the room and there's what you, I think, call diapers. We call them nappies. And there's a mess, <laughs> absolute mess, toys all over the place. And this researcher almost falls over. There's a lot of noise going on. The baby is screaming and the researcher is screaming inside. I don't want to be doing this. I want to get down to my interview. How am I going to manage this? And then another um, researcher, you know, Let's, let's turn, turn it back to the beginning, goes in, it happens to be a, a, a woman, and she notices, oh, there's a lot of life here, you know, there's a lot of energy, all these toys, there's something very exciting going on. And then she, she, she comes in, and the, the, the young mother says, come in, and, and the, the baby is quite distressed. And um, the, uh, the, the mother is, in a, in a way, I say trying is the wrong word. It's, it's attunement to the baby's distress. And then there's that mimetic quality whereby the, 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 the noise between the people begins to change, between mm -hmm. the mother and the baby, mm -hmm. into um, a, a more melodic, less distressed music. And eventually there is chuckling. And the question that the researcher then asks or starts from is is that the moment of, of magic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the and the young mother feels recognised, mm -hmm. seen, and a very rich conversation starts yeah. afterwards. I've, I've felt that as a facilitator of small group work. I mean, there are moments when the the atmosphere and the climate in the group just feels completely chaotic and nonsensical, and I can't make sense of it, and I don't know what's going on. And then I need to remind myself just to relax and let be. And oftentimes when I do that, these kinds of experiences, mm. things begin to come into, into focus. Mm. Mm. Things begin to make sense in ways that weren't making sense before. And I think it's very similar to the story mm. that, that you're reflecting. I'm wondering, Linda, it's probably in the few minutes that we have remaining, is what are your concerns about the field of transformative learning, I mean, as a movement, as a body of literature, as a scholarship, as a practice, what are, what are your main concerns or issues? It's too fast. Mm. I, I feel a, a, a freneticism. Um, I feel a freneticism at this, this conference. Mm. I feel a freneticism in, in some of the writing about transformative learning and people aren't stopping long enough to think about um, what on earth is going on. I think from a European perspective, maybe from a, a, a British perspective, an English perspective, I'm adding so many riders here, aren't I? Um, that there can be um, the, the issue of translation mm. across um, in, into Europe. And I think sometimes the transformative learning thing gets caught up with, a, um, with, with concerns in the academy about um, globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, which some see as a synonym for Americanization. And I think that causes great problems. So, um, you know, I don't see it as, you know, a kind of binary. There's a lot of richness going on here. There's, you know, your own work and, and, and others. Um, and, and there's a lot of richness across there. So there has to be a sort of meeting between uh, different and rich traditions to see how much we can yeah. eclectically use a range of perspectives to help us to better understand 
the struggles, the difficulties, the possibilities of humans transforming in a world which is, after all, you're struggling yeah. in crisis. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think for, for me, the concern that I have is, and I agree with the freneticism, and I, and I often think that that's what's going on is a, is a defensive maneuver against the real learning that's just below the surface at these conferences. Mm. We talk a lot about sort of stuff, you know, mm. but the work of transformation really unveils our inner demons. We, become, we yes. come face to face with our inner demons, yes. and oftentimes more than one. Yes. And that takes great strength and great humility and um, you know, a willingness to sort of engage, to, to dance, to romance the shadow. Yes. Um, and I'm afraid that there's so much going on in this process that we've gotten ourselves <laughs> bound up in is that, you know, it's hard to tell when people are really engaging the shadow and when they're running like hell from it. And, and I think more often than not, some of the stuff that's being done and published and written about is a running away from the very essence of what transformative learning really is all about. And that's what I, I think that's what worries me most, is that we're going to create or contribute to a field which is really a, a large defensive reaction to, mm -hmm. you know, real searching of this one's soul, I guess. Yes, I just had a conversation before now about somebody who was involved in uh, police training, the training mm -hmm. of police officers. And, and it was about mental health or mental illness and you know we can classify the world in ter terms of a simple binary between the mentally ill and uh, the mentally well which I think is a highly questionable binary right, right. and I think it's a spectrum and we, we all have I mean you might call them demons I might you know call them um, something else um, destructive mm -hmm. uh, qualities in ourselves I mean, which we can you know think about in all kinds of ways how that's uh, created but the point I'm getting at is that for the police officers, um, in the discussion we had, what becomes very important is to recognize that um, mental distress, which may be another way of framing it, is something they recognize in their own biographies. Mm -hmm. So the otherness process, or the othering process, is reduced. And, and suddenly you recognize something in the other, the criminal on the street corner who yeah. may be psychotic or whatever you recognize something in yourself and i think that can be potentially very very important yep yep yep, yep right i guess the one thing that i wanted to sort of add to in terms of the story part of this that is this this idea has been with me um mm. as long as i can remember um when i i mean i did my undergraduate work in microbiology right and okay. worked, worked for five years as a clinical microbiologist and then went on to do work in medical education. Mm. But I can remember distinctly in my, one of my first years as a microbiologist of reading um, Carl Rogers' you know, mm. um, client-centered therapy yeah. and, and his book that he did with Barry Stevens on Don't Push the River, It Flows by Itself. I read mm. Rollo May and instead of studying for a physics exam, I read his being <laughs> his love, yeah. power and innocence, love and will, and I was just absolutely taken by the ways in which um, they were they were giving me a language and a way of thinking about myself that I hadn't had before. I come from a small dairy farm in northern Wisconsin, for God's sakes. They won't talk about these things. Um, but there was something about their ideas, and I think that's probably grounded in my own sort of upbringing as a Roman Catholic. I think there's a, mm. there's a kind of spirituality, a kind of sacredness to mm. that inquiry that I was engaged in. And mm. that led ultimately to you know, what I later came to call self-knowledge, and I'm still not quite sure what I mean by that, but it has something to do with understanding just who I am and why I do what I do and what, why I believe what I believe. And in that sort of essence, that was like, you know, 40 years ago. Mm. And that's still, that feeling and that idea of thinking about this has still, is still with me even to this day when I write about and look at, uh, you know, s situations of transformative learning. So this notion of, ultimately for me, transformative learning is about the realization of self-knowledge. Mm. And self-knowledge means a transpersonal sense of self, not just <coughs> this mm. individualized sense. And so I just wanted to sort of make sure that we were, you know, that I was clear about where I'm coming from with respect. And this is really a, a life journey of mine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I might might use slightly 
different language and there might be difference, but that's fine. Um, but there may be similarities, we're just mm -hmm. using different terms. I mean, I, I, I have um, a love affair with, you know, different authors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and sometimes I, 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 I love what they're writing, sometimes I hate them because I wished I'd written that first. <laughs> that's right. um, but I'm finding that about your work, by the way. <laughs> God damn it, he said it before I did. <laughs> No, and, and uh, but also mentioning the spirituality thing. I mean, in, in the work I've been doing recently, it's almost a, uh, almost been a process of coming out. I mm. I feel one of the problems in a European context is that we don't talk about spirituality or mm. even religious perspectives mm. enough. It's just not the done thing. Here in the States, I think it's much more the done thing, which can mm -hmm. which can present a, another problem. Right. Yeah. that we need to look at that more, more, more closely. But certainly in my own journey, and you know I've been thinking about um, pilgrimage and, uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the, the feeling sometimes, we, we may set off with the idea of walking, let's say, to Santiago de Compostela and we're going to be transformed. But then we get lost, we don't know what we're doing, we're hurting, we're full of pain. And that to me is a good metaphor. We, is, our yeah. feet are Precisely. killing, you know. And, um, and at moments like that, I, I think um, a telephone interrupts. <laughs> um, at moments like, like like that, sometimes just sitting down, being quiet, um, thinking about or being in touch with what we don't know, mm -hmm. being lost, mm -hmm. being in pain, and 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 what these things represent, and then eventually finding the resources to. I mean, Libby Tisdale talks about this in our own mm -hmm. writing on spirituality, uh, literally or metaphorically picking up our bed and continuing mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to walk. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the problem with the literature, going back to an earlier question, is it's sanitized. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't sort of represent uh, all these different dimensions. And if we, with, not in a macabre way, but if we recognize more of the multi-dimensionality of, of lifelong learning journeys or, or whatever, I think we'd speak mm -hmm. to more people. Yeah, I love that metaphor of the pilgrimage. And you know, that I've, I've certainly used that idea in my own work with short-term study abroad programs. We've, we've think, we think about, or I think about, the, the self within those contexts mm. is on a bit of a pilgrimage, even if the students don't sort of see that, you can mm. start it. There's a, you know, there's a departure, and there's a, the classic signs and, and aspects of a pilgrimage, and right below the surface of that is you know, who am I? What is this yeah. context telling me as a who am I as a person, and so forth? So, um, that the idea of a pilgrimage is a very rich and pilgrimage can be dangerous. Very much so. You can get lost. The light well, can fade. And yeah, see, that's the other thing about, for, at least from Jung's perspective of transformation and transformative learning, is that there's no guarantees that this is going to lead you to a better life, to a happier life. No. There's nothing here that what it says is your life will be more meaningful. Hmm. But it doesn't promise you rose gardens. It doesn't. No. I mean, this, that's the other part of this sort of transformative learning stuff, which bugs me a little bit. Is like there's this undercurrent of, you know, happy happiness and, and lightness of being, and, and but it's hell of a lot of work, and uh, oftentimes can lead to disruptions in one's life that you recognize that you took a turn years ago that was the wrong turn, and now you're faced mm -hmm. with the consequences and the pain of that consequence. And, all of those things. I came across a, a little um, uh, kind of uh, statement that I think Silicon Valley uses a lot, and I think it's a quotation from um, Samuel Beckett, mm. and it's Worstwood Ho, which is a play on Westwood Ho mm. in the 19th century. So Worstwood Ho is the descent into barbarism in the 20th yeah, century yeah, with yeah. two uh, world wars. And it's something like fail fail, fail again, fail better. But actually, I, because of writing something about this, I, I went back to Worstwood Ho, hmm. is the title, um, and, and read the whole thing. It's, hmm. it's much more enigmatic, it's much more problematic. And what, what the writing, and you know, Beckett can be very ob obtuse yeah, and sure. difficult sometimes. What the writing is actually, I think, pointing to is sometimes we fail, mm -hmm. N not as a not as a step in a journey towards doing something better in a new startup company, but we we fail, and that's part of 
human mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And perhaps to realize that, to realize that you know, not everything is going to be good and, yeah. and rosy ca can, can be transformative because it releases ourselves in a certain sense from this terrible tyranny of linearity yeah. and, and progress. This, this, the story that animates me a lot, I mean, is Dante's Inferno, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like it captures and, and characterizes, you know, almost all of the sort of the complexity of the journey. And then there's the promise of, you know, Beatrice at the end yes. and the coming together and all of that. But and that's sort of what sort of keeps me going mm. in terms of not sort of throwing in the towel at any point in time. What your work does, it seems to me, is to re-acquaint uh, us with an older language mm. which we tend to dismiss like demonic or yeah. demons. I mean... Or even soul. Or even yeah. soul. No, absolutely. And I think that that's incredibly important. But I think the, the, the idea of things like heaven and hell, I've lived in moments of hell or mm -hmm. bits of hell mm -hmm. in, in my own life. And I've also had glimpses of the divine, the, the heavenly in others, in a beautiful piece of writing, in a moment of connectedness, maybe on a pilgrimage, where my heart somehow has sung. Mm -hmm. And I see in some, what somebody else is teaching me or telling me, I see a, a glimpse of heaven. And I think the, the difficulty, and maybe it's not so much a difficulty in North America, it's certainly a difficulty in Europe, is the loss of these words, the loss of this vocabulary, means we are impoverished in the way we talk about things like what happens in a classroom or somebody's learning biography or educational processes more generally. Yeah, yeah. Our language isn't quite good enough for what we have to do at yeah, the I moment. I think you're absolutely right about that. It's the cultural constraints of it. Well, all right, maybe we should take yeah. this moment to yeah. end here. And yeah. Is there anything else you want to ask us that we haven't? I think you guys um, pretty much shed light on um, everything that they have here. Um, That's our job, shedding light. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and, illumination. Um, probably one on here. Uh, why are you excited about uh, attending the conference and what takeaways do you expect? Oh, so the conference. Well, this conference, like all... Are you recording? Yes. I yeah, okay, sorry. This conference, like all conferences for me, gives me the opportunity to spend time with people mm. that I enjoy spending time with, that mm. I like, and we, we can talk with one another. That's the most important part for me. And I get frustrated when the conference creates obstacles in my way to do that. So there's a, there's a love-hate relationship for me between the structure of the conference and the, what the conference is really all about. I find them pulled in different ways by that. Some of the papers are interesting, but I really enjoy the people spending I, time with them. I think that's right, and just having this, this conversation now, I think there's a problem of being over-programmed, and I think that's right. an anxiety about, you know, people have paid a large amount of money to be, to be here, so we mm -hmm. have to give them so much, but you've been given too much. Um, I mean, sometimes it's the unexpected, it's the... Um, it's, it's that moment where you wander into a room and you have a conversation with somebody. Maybe, you know, somebody you know, but maybe somebody you don't know. Like the story about the yeah. police training this yeah, morning. That, exactly. was, that yeah. was one of those moments. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether we use the word serendipity or whatever, but you, you find yourself into a space which is creative, energizing, and mm -hmm. giving you um, a new sense of possibility. But, but also catching up with, with you know, someone like your, 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 yourself and um, rediscovering a contact, just enjoying the words you're using. Right, right, right. I would say that would be true for me mm -hmm. too.